everyone. We are here today talking with the filmmakers behind Something in the Dirt. It is kind of hard to classify, which is part of the fun, but we've got producer David Lawson here. We've got Justin Benson, director, writer, producer, editor, and co-star, and Aaron Moorhead, director, director of photography, producer, and editor. You guys wear a lot of hats. That's kind of your thing, right? But I'm wondering, um, I think that this was, correct me if I'm wrong, the first movie that you shot during the pandemic. Um, and I'm kind of wondering, you know, you, you've done, you've collaborated so closely over the years on, I think it was five features. Did the pandemic teach you anything new about the way that you collaborate? And, um, you know, kind of did, did it change the flavor of the way that you had done things in the past? Did it add anything new? I mean, a couple of things shook out of the pandemic in terms of, I guess, like more emotional reasoning behind filmmaking and that obviously everyone was really isolated for a long time, uh, including us from each other. Aaron and I less so, but definitely us and Dave. Mm. And when we essentially, Dave created the protocols based off the information at the time to make this film, it allowed us to be in the same room, at least the three of us together. And it made us like really realize that one of the primary reasons we make films is to have this thing we create with our friends. That came even sharper into focus when right after somehow um, Aaron and I, after you might call it years of unemployment or like, or like just really sporadic, all of a sudden we just randomly had all these jobs back to back. I'm not just saying this because Dave's here. We literally missed Dave so much. And not because the, the jobs are going bad. It was just that like, I was like, man, these are insane. These are awesome opportunities you can never complain about. But we really missed um, making films like we made this film. Yeah, I, I think that's something that everybody always mentions. Uh, like we have, a, we have a special relationship where the three of us are legit, really good friends outside of um, really enjoying working together. And also uh, we really respect the talent that each of us bring. We do wear a lot of hats. Um, and in some places there's overlap, in some places there's not overlap. And you know, one of us is particularly good in a skill set. And I think we all appreciate each other in that. And it's just it's really fun. Like Justin was saying, to like just get to make movies with your friends. I think that's why we're in the business. You know, th this is a movie um, you know, kind of hard to to place in in a time you're dealing with these possible supernatural forces, um, although we don't ever really get a, a, an answer as to what exactly is going on. Um, but, you know, it looks in so many ways, it looks like an LA that is very believably real, like, you know, planes flying overhead, shitty apartments, traffic, wildfire. Um, I think, you know, there was kind of some uh, references to lockdowns. So, yeah, I'm wondering, can you tell me just about your approach to like, you know, creating this world that these characters are living in and as they're navigating this um, phenomenon and their, you know, their their ambitions of making it big with a documentary? Yeah, uh, it was something that we were actually talking about this morning um, that we didn't do it completely intentionally, but a person that we greatly admire is Alan Moore, all of his works. And something he did is this gigantic tome called Jerusalem, but he does this in, in all of his, almost all of his work, um, where he kind of lays a secret, mystical, almost occultish history on top of the places that he lives or grew up or, or he's in the environments he's in. And, uh, and we think that we were probably inspired to do that with the secret history of Los Angeles, where there's so many um, films where Los Angeles plays itself you know, or, or plays a, a heightened version of it or whatever. But we didn't have any that completely mirrored our own experience. So we realized, because the city's gigantic, it's a, it's a huge place. And, uh, and this is very literally our own experience. I mean, it's our apartment, we're in it right now. And, uh, <laughs> it's how we feel about the city. The city has kind of a reverberation, dark and light, but an underbelly that you can go and explore. Laurel Canyon in particular, uh, which is near where we live, the, um, um, there's whole books written about the, the bizarre, mm. occulty, 70s psychedelia, um, CIA psyops kind of things that happen in this area. And although we, we weren't talking about all of those exactly right when we were making the movie, 
we realized that it kind of infiltrated our psyche and made us want to tell uh, a story that involved the hidden side of Los Angeles. Kind of the occult things and, and these conspiracy theories, was that something that was of interest to you or was it, you know, something that was kind of born out of this uh, awareness that, you know, people are really looking to conspiracy theories now to explain things that are that are going on? Well, there's obviously a lot of people looking to conspiracy theories to explain what's going on for sure. But I, I think that the bigger thing for us in terms of how this connects to what you're saying, the occult and all of that, we spent years uh, working on several different projects about the turn of the century occultist, Alistair Crowley. And it's still our white whale. It's still like this thing we're kind of like obsessed with to like finally make someday. But some of that stuff, some of the spirit of that stuff definitely ended up in this movie in terms of the, the occult stuff and like the reference, the references to Jack Parsons, uh, who was a follower of Alistair Crowley. And in fact, there's even imagery, pictures of Alistair Crowley in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's so many things that were, this, the, the assembly edit of this film is three and a half hours long and there's so many things we're going to miss. But, uh, but there used to be a, a lot of crossover between, um, accidental crossover between actual occultists and what we were doing. Yeah, so a lot of these ideas sounds like we're kind of like percolating all, you know, in your head and, you know, some new things that you brought in and, um, you know, kind of all came out in this movie. I would say that generally, like, the, a, a lot of the stuff that's talked about in the film is stuff that we would talk about in some form or another when we're just hanging out over some beers, so it's, you know, especially with, you know, like Justin said, we've, there's been a lot of Aleister Crowley research and I think we've all read several books and gone on the deep dives on the internet and it's, you know, it just seeps into our natural conversation. Justin Aaron, you, you know, you guys play off each other so well and, you know, you obviously, you know, I think you can see the chemistry of your real life friendship in the movie, you know, as you're playing these characters. But I'm wondering, Justin, in the in the process of writing the screenplay, you know, are you kind of um, you hear a lot of screenwriters talk about writing the part for a certain person, but I'm wondering, are your, you know, kind of your personal chemistry with each other and, you know, your sensibilities, your temperaments, is that baked into the characters at all? Or are these unlike the people who you are in real life? That's a really interesting question. Um, one thing is, is whenever we do a project like this, typically Aaron and I will spend quite a bit of time just talking about what is the character we want to play that is best for this story? What are the characteristics we do have within ourselves that can that can come out in this character? Or even things you just desire to perform that isn't you, but you want to play make-believe that thing. But this movie is really interesting because we did very much intentionally make the characters so wildly different from, from who we actually are in real life that uh, I don't know if there's... It's weird. I'm already watching the movie saying like, there's just not much of Aaron in John. And I don't think it's harder for me. I mean, these guys might be like, no, you are exactly like Levi, but I see it and I don't see any of myself in, in Levi anymore. Um, when we were doing it in this apartment together for a month, more so, yeah. <laughs> like you felt like you were this other person, but I don't, I don't think either one of us really sees much of our actual selves within it. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, the chemistry note, thank you so much for that we're not actually usually totally performing against each other in those scenes because one person had to hold the camera and it wasn't <laughs> the other line. Yeah. For, someone's whispering their lines behind the camera, yeah. but oftentimes your scene partner was like a spot on the wall. But we did do tons of rehearsal, so hopefully that is where this oddball chemistry came out between these, these two uh, really weird guys. Yeah, we, I, I know uh, when we were shooting it, we, we had each decided this, but I know for myself, uh, I decided my character was totally right and made and everything he said made perfect sense and I had to make it make perfect sense to myself, you know, and even though I'm talking about cat parasites, you know, because I, I really did think this character's conviction, but also self-awareness of how crazy it sounds would be the only way that I could believe it as the director. I can't know that I'm kind of funny, you know, I have to know that everything, I have to feel like I'm an intrepid explorer, you know, Levi is humble, but doesn't doesn't know that he's ridiculous. You know? and in, in, in every scene at a certain point, you have to like kind of renegotiate with each other and ourselves of like, why is Levi still there? Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 
<laughs> and I think that's where him and I also diverge as character and person. Where I was like, I would have bounced out so, so, much, <laughs> so much sooner. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, I, this is something we interestingly found ourselves doing with The Endless, and even more so, I uh, Endless was two movies ago, but even more so with this film. Uh, we were editing the movie and it was immediate. Like, like on day one of editing, we were talking about what was happening. And we say, we point to the screen to ourselves and say, John didn't do that here. You know, Levi doesn't do that here, whatever, whatever that is. And we realized that that's not patting ourselves on the back. It's more just talking about our perception of, of our own selves versus the characters that are on screen. Um, they, they just felt like different people to us. You know, that all seems like it, it adds such an interesting layer to like, you know, the whole structure of the movie of these guys making a documentary and, you know, people talking about the documentary that they're making and people, you know, there's just all these little, these layers of, of observation that's going on and, and commentary. What was it about, like, you know, just kind of this idea that in the film of them creating a documentary that was appealing to you uh, as a way to kind of get across the ideas that you were that you were going for. There's a lot of things. I mean, one of the things was it really opened up the format of making a feature for us away from the four prior movies we did before that. It opened it up into a structure and format that we had never experimented with before, never used before, and something that we are huge fans of. I mean, we're, who isn't? Who, no one here isn't a fan of especially like true crime documentaries or documentaries about the supernatural. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that, that was really cool. Uh, and then that format worked especially well because once we had finished principal photography, the bulk of it, we still had a lot of shots to get over like the next year while we were traveling. So because of that format, like we could shoot in Petra, we could shoot in Budapest, we could, and, and it would make sense within that format. Yeah. Um, and actually the, the very first, not the kernel of, hey, let's make a, a movie during this, this uh, horrible dark time in the world, but that, that started earlier. But the very first like sentence of the plot was kind of a, what would we actually do? What would we actually do if something were to happen supernaturally in one of our apartments? And so it actually started off much more seriously. It probably wasn't, it wasn't like a, 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 co a comedic premise. It was like, what did two highly functioning, normal people that are not specialized in it, you know, do. Our initial instinct was like, well, I definitely would try to document it and, and try to document it in a way that doesn't seem like it could be faked. But I'd also think going more into character and not something that we would personally do, but it's like, well, you don't call the FBI, you know, you don't, like, you don't call the police, you don't call a, a, a ghost show, you know, not us at least. We try to document it and then we imagined characters that would feel the need to profit off of that documentation. And we're like, that's a movie. That, that makes perfect sense to us. That, that says something about what's going on, how people feel, and, um, and uh, it kind of spiraled out from there. It was funny, a funny thing though. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing to try to um, have characters expressing their, their introduction into filmmaking, they're novice filmmakers. And I'm not saying we personally are masters of filmmaking or anything. It's just funny to like try to think of like, like well, it's not what we would say. We what we would say would be way overly complicated or 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 inside baseball or inside baseball. But like, there's a funny line in the movie about like how much they think, how much money they think they're gonna make if the movie <laughs> sells at a film festival. And uh, and that, that's like that's like an example of something. It's like, oh yeah, I used to think that. I used to think that like 15 years ago. It's like hey, you make a movie and it sells for a million dollars. Sundance <laughs> and uh, it was it was fun to like to try to remember those things before you were uh, at least somewhat educated with a couple of decades of filmmaking 10 million dollars to Netflix I yeah. mean sounds good yeah. <laughs> actually is the, is the line still referencing specifically Sundance no no to. oh it used to yeah. we, like, we definitely did a taper like a Sundance <laughs> documentary sell all the time to Netflix <laughs> <laughs> with all the mythology that, that that's kind of baked in there and the occultism and, you know, I'm wondering like, how do you see, what are the forces that are acting on these characters? Like if it is not necessarily supernatural forces, I mean, you know, there's kind of the ego stuff and the, the delusions and, you know, they're definitely being impacted by certain ways of thinking. And I'm wondering how you guys see that. Man, I love that question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
we have like a obviously in private you got like there's a there's truths in this movie that are there even though the two characters don't see them mm-hmm. and we know those truths Pro- i mean obviously we wouldn't want to say the supernatural mythology out loud and, and kill that for everybody but uh but there was something for us from the very beginning so interesting about like like look what if something supernatural, otherworldly, paranormal, whatever you want to call it, it definitely happened. But uh, these two guys in the world we live in, um, they just get so far off base, jumping mm-hmm. to conclusions that are half truths, and, and and again, and like you said, ego and and all of this. But um, but we actually were talking about about this morning, and we had like a really good analogy for this, the the, the, the UFO analogy. Oh yeah. You know, we do believe when people say that they saw a UFO. We don't think that everybody that ever says that is lying. You know, we do believe that they, they saw something. But the world has spent so much time developing myths around what that is that it's starting to feed into itself like an Ouroboros. So people say, I saw a UFO. And what they're implying by I saw a UFO is I saw the spacecraft of an alien from another planet. You know, and that's like what that means now. But that's actually, that's a mythology. It might be true, it might not, but it is, it's a story that we've culturally told ourselves and we've actually shut the door to a lot of alternative explanations um, that are maybe more plausible, maybe more fun, maybe more interesting. Um, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's quite unlikely that it's actually an alien spacecraft. I couldn't tell you what is likely, but, um, but it is, it's, it's interesting that the, the stories that we've told ourselves it, and not in any diabolical way, it's just, just the way that we try to explain the world starts actually closing the door to creativity and, that I, and actually in some ways opening the door to, you know, the rabbit holes like what this movie is about, um, where it's like, if you just take one wrong conclusion and then define your life by it and then continue down that wrong conclusion, you can end up somewhere pretty dark. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, is like, I think when we, like the first sentence talking about the plot of this movie, you know, what, what would we do? It felt like it would become a movie about obsession, you know, like, like a Zodiac or something like that. You just follow the clues, 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 clues. We realized it's actually not a movie about obsession. Uh, that's probably what the character of John thinks of himself as. I'm obsessed, I'm driven. He's actually delusional and self-aggrandizing. That's what it really is. It's about, it's about humility. Like that, that's what the movie ends up weirdly being about is, is a lack of humility in the face of something impossibly large. I just realized it now. <laughs> this is our first interview, so it's, yeah, yeah. so we don't have any canned answers about it yet. Thank you, thank you for helping us figure out this film for ourselves. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, another thing I liked, you know, just th- th- these little bits of commentary, like, you know, Le- Levi mentioning that someone told him if he fixed his teeth, it, his tips would go up 20 to 40% which was just like, so it was just so dark. I thought it was hilarious. And, you know, it's, that's kind of the, one, another one of the elements where I was like, yeah, this is so believably LA and it's so, you know, th- this is something I know and am and, and so familiar with, you know, despite the, the fantastical element of the supernatural here. I feel like that's something that I that I always appreciate about Justin's writing is that that his characters are so believable, especially when it's something that like is very lived in. Obviously, grew up in San Diego, so a lot of the characters from from Resolution and Endless had, you know, bits of pieces that he grew up in. And this one, obviously, in Los Angeles, it, everything just feels like it was a conversation that you happened to stumble upon. Uh, it or, you know, might have even been a conversation that was stumbled upon. A lot of our movies, I think this one has the fewest times where characters express something that I would personally believe. <laughs> like, like it's almost, like, they say almost nothing that I hold actually, that I personally believe. Um, whereas I can say like with our other films, not like everyone kind of, throughout the movie, there's things where it's like, I, I, I more or less, I would say something like that. This one's almost nothing. <laughs> And in fact, it's probably the movie with the most number of lines in the movie that are just things that, you know, like I heard a friend say 20 years ago back home in San Diego, but it's not, I don't believe, I don't personally hold that as my own belief in any way. We have, um, uh, we, we have this, this uh, odd barometer for how much we enjoy particular movies just here and there. Um, often there's, a, there's a, this idea that if the dialogue doesn't move the plot forward, it should get struck, you know? 
Um, and by the way, there are there are extremely economical movies that use that law to great effect. It's some of our favorite movies, but we actually, you know, we feel like plot and character are as intertwined, is, are so intertwined that if the dialogue furthers the character, it is therefore going to further the plot. Um, and, and it thickens it and because it's going to inform the way that you think that a reaction might happen later and all of that. So for us, like, like the very, very beginning of it, we're like, we need to be able to have conversations that don't feel like they're about the plot, but they end up being about the story, you know, about the story being told about these two people and, and the tragedy or whatever you want to say happened between the two of them. It looked to me like you used a lot of visual effects in this movie, yet it still, it still felt, you know, very grounded, real, like something that could happen. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what was your approach with visual effects in, you know, definitely it seemed like it was something that helped tell the story because of the nature of it, um, but it wasn't something that took away from, from the realism of it? It's funny, the, the original plan was for me to be able to do all the visual effects myself, um, which was would have been an impossible task, but especially once we got Merkai 81 and Moon Knight, completely impossible um so so i ended up only doing about half of them the easier ones at that but the uh the general approach um it's funny because the, the toughest part of it was just the fact that there was only an in-person crew of the two of us and dave and there was nobody else on set um so you know shooting visual effects shots where there's somebody holding something up and someone has to roll camera someone has to flicker a light you know and all of that there's a it's a very difficult uh process but, uh, but we tried to get as much of the, the floating prism thing in camera as possible so we wouldn't have to make a CGI prism. And some of the, the, the projected, they're called caustics, that kind of rainbow light that refracts through it. Some of that actually was through a projector, but most of it was through our visual effects supervisor who came on and just did a spectacular job with our nonsense named Alban. Um, He's the hero of this movie. Yeah, could not believe it. Uh, what's funny is, you know, up until a couple of months ago, if you saw a cut of this movie before all the VFX were in, okay. there's a certain scene where a couch is floating. That's all we can. That's all I'll say here. If you it, the rough cut, we're always holding like we're in the scene, and it cut to us holding things up, and it, it looked ridiculous. But on top of that, for character reasons, like Aaron and I had like lost a little bit of weight for the job. But by the time we had been operating camera for a month, we overshot losing weight. We were we're like, so, we were so like so like so, so much weak. littler than we really usually are. And it's like, there's this image of me and Dave holding up a couch and I look like I'm about to break in two pieces. It looks <laughs> ridiculous. I, and somehow Sundance saw the cut where every time something floats, there's his tattooed arm holding it, like literally him. And, uh, and still they, they let the film in because they had enough imagination to know where it was gonna go. Because <laughs> all the visual effects came together in the last like two or three months. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was really hard to uh, get a 747 to keep on flying over our apartment, though. Yeah, you know, that was rough. A lot of, the walkie-talkies don't have the range that they used to. That's just... <laughs> yeah. So this was literally the three of you in your apartment making this movie. Yeah. yeah. We had remote crews that, like, we had a remote art department that would drop stuff off to us that we were using, you know, a day or a couple days ahead of time, and we would bring it up to Justin's apartment. But... Um, you know, in order to keep the idea was in order to keep this as safe as possible, it was to keep it as small as possible. Like I was our COVID compliance officer. I took the class and became certified. Um, still tested all the time. Yeah, <laughs> we, we still practice. We, 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 you know, obviously when it made sense, we were wearing masks. However, Justin and Aaron are in every shot. So, you know, they weren't then, but when it made sense, um, there's some behind the scenes footage that's pretty hilarious, specifically of the VFX gags and just like, running around behind the camera and like flipping light suites. I'm very much looking forward to putting that together. Yeah. <laughs> I the, would uh, love to see that. The art department knew, obviously also made all of those props and probably pretty obvious, but they designed the, the design of the space we were in. Um, that was my, that, it's shot in my apartment. My apartment was left looking like that up until like two weeks ago. <laughs> it was like, like, like a crap dad. Yeah. yeah, it was, <laughs> it was not a good <laughs> <laughs> to, to, be, to be fair, we did go back and shoot a couple things that were missing, so it wasn't. We yeah, needed it. That yeah, it we needed that. It was yeah. just, it was just funny. But it, it is so, fun to see. Like that's we live in the same apartment building, so like that. That's my apartment. Is John's apartment? Um, you know the the computer that John does graphic design on. That was the editing computer for the movie. <laughs> the hard drive for the movie is in the movie. <laughs> <laughs>
but not not melted. I hope. No, luckily there was no hard. Oh yeah, there was a hard. Drive. Oh no, we did. No, 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 no. Yeah. we always have a backup, but we definitely did have a hard drive completely crash on us um, yeah. that had all the footage, and it was so meta to making them. Such an unbelievable amount of art imitating life, imitating art, imitating life, <laughs> just by nature of it, because we live in the place we are. We look like the people. We're shooting a movie, we're a movie where people are shooting a movie. And it just every day there was a new thing being like, okay, am I, this is very Twilight Zone right now. This is correct. Like it, even even on camera, things like, are you, are you telling me that as the director or as a character? <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. That was fun. So we actually sometimes had to be like, okay, this is director Aaron, really quick, just say that a little slower. You know? Also, though, by the way, it was a joy. Oh, uh, so much. We fun. haven't mentioned that exactly yet, but it was so such fun. a joy. Yeah. There's usually like a time after you make a film that you need to like decompress until you remember all of the good things you just need to like step away for a minute. Cause it's just, it's such an intense experience. I remember texting Justin and Aaron the day after and was like, I, I miss, I kind of miss being on set. It was a lot of work, but like, like Justin said earlier, it was the first time the three of us had hung out together in eight months or with like anyone, or <laughs> with anyone. you know, I think that that was also probably a big part of it as well. It was definitely the most enjoyable movie we've ever made. Yeah, but where principal photography was like that enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like that comes across. You know, it's like it, there, there's a good energy in in it that I'm like, yeah, they're they're really enjoying themselves here. I I always I always joke that I can watch a movie and tell you whether or not the crew was having fun making it, and I I, I believe that. Like it's it's something that we talk about all the time as a company. It's like we want to foster like good positive set experiences because you can tell in the final product when people hate something it's very clear you know were there some movies that you watched that you know kind of sparked some inspiration for making this or just in general things that you've seen recently that uh that you really like there were a lot i mean yeah it's like tons, tons. it's funny a big one and i don't know if this comes through it's probably better if it doesn't in these situations especially legally um, <laughs> <laughs> but the uh um, the Frank big Lebowski. Yeah, that's right. The, the, the Big Lebowski, the big yeah. Lebowski was a thing where it was like, and that where that like reflects tonally. It's like, oh, Levi's hair. Um, a lot of things about ourselves in the, in a lot of things about our characters in general. Um, there are things that it's like that's not like what you would call like traditionally attractive in cinema or cool or anything, but um, in the tradition of the greatest stories about LA gotta be eccentrics and have weird things. <laughs> I mean, also there's just like a guy finding a weird underbelly of LA and following a weird rabbit hole to, gain, you know, to gain some. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's funny. That one came up, I think like a week before principal photography. Like, it's like the Big Lebowski. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, we know Errol Morris documentaries. Oh, wow. We watched a lot of those. We watched, actually, we watched every single one of them. Yeah. For me, I know that John saw himself as, as an Errol Morris, you know, not a, a wedding photographer using his camera's video function for the first time. Um, yeah, Errol Morris was a huge one. There's a lot of movies that this movie's a reaction to in, in the sense that um, obviously the movies we've made prior, they're typically generally categorized as being like, oh, horror or sci-fi. And um, even though they're oftentimes hard to categorize. So when in the industry at large, when it's time to like, to, to, to get a, uh, a, a job like hired by a job that's not just us the stuff that gets sent to us is like oh it's like stuff like like things like poltergeist or um amityville horror or like paranormal activity like these more traditional haunted house stories or haunted building stories and after 10 years of thinking over how we would do that if we were to do it and ultimately always ending up so far left of center no one would ever say yes this happened um, over and over and over, <laughs> by the way. That, the result of that was sort of like 10 years of development of this movie, where a lot of those ideas ended up in. Yeah. I also just remember when we were on set, we, uh, we, we lovingly referred to it uh, as um, Pineapple Express, like Pie <laughs> Pineapple Express, you know? There's like kind of a stoner buddy comedy thing, and then there's also like an obsessive code-like darkness to the whole thing. And somehow we smashed those together, and for us it works really well. It's funny because there's, it's a, as you said earlier, it's kind of hard to describe. Um, it's hard to, to put a really a this meets this on it. And when you do a correct this meets this, it's like, what does that equal? <laughs> <laughs>